This is part two of non-iterative and iterative image reconstruction methods. And here we'll be um, quickly going through a Fourier analysis of uh, the noise in back projector then filter reconstruction and gain quite a few insights into inverse problems in general. So this is the well-known situation we're in where we're saying we've got a true object and we're modeling uh, an output of an imaging system by simply a convolution, a linear shift invariant mapping. Uh, which applies uh, for back projected PET data and uh, can also be used to model uh, zero field MRI reconstructions as well. So it goes beyond just PET. Um, so here I'm showing a very crude uh, brain phantom as a true object and there's the point spread function. Each point object inside this brain phantom simply gets replaced by uh, an appropriately scaled point spread function or point response function to give the output. This is just a very simple uh, substitution process that's going on. And as we know, the Fourier uh, transform diagonalizes it, uh, just turns this into a simple multiplication, and therefore we have a very straightforward reconstruction algorithm, albeit for a uh, shift invariant, uh, linear shift invariant system. And we'll be getting on to more general cases as we go along. So, um, this is quite educational to consider, first of all, uh, the spectrum, the Fourier domain description of, in fact, any true object that we might image. Here I'm showing uh, a brainweb um, phantom used uh, for simulations, uh, for example, of FDG distributions in PET. And uh, on the right-hand side, in fact, for a more crudely sampled version of that, there we go, uh, I'm showing um, the, uh, the Fourier transform of that. I'm just looking at a profile through the Fourier transform taking the absolute value, because obviously you get negatives in the, in the, for the Fourier coefficients as well as positive values, and then taking the logarithm. Um, and that's because um, we get often very large components at lower spatial frequencies. And to visualize the whole of the spectrum comfortably, uh, the log can really help with that. Um, so I point this out because um, obviously in this B BPF reconstruction, this is what we've been seeking uh, to reconstruct, that uh, spectrum, um, with a view to then doing the uh, inverse for a transform, of course. And of course, in MR as well, that's what you're seeking to do. You're trying to find the, um, uh, the spectrum of the object in the field of view so that you can then, if you're doing fully sampled case space, for example, in MR, you can just then inverse for a transform your fully sampled case space. So um, in BPF, in PET, and in MR, we're basically trying to get this. Um, now, this is a very interesting um, finding, the riemann lebesgue lemma, which points out that the spectrum of any function, basically, um, certainly the ones we're interested in um, in medical imaging, objects in a, in a medical imaging scanner's field of view, um, the Fourier domain spectrum will, um, as you go to higher and higher spatial frequencies, gradually tend towards zero. And in fact, as you get to the limiting case of approaching infinite spatial frequency, which would correspond to very high frequency oscillations, if you like, the sinusoidal functions would be kind of very rapid up-down oscillations. Um, for spatial frequencies like that, um, the coefficient, whatever the object, will always tend towards zero. And, and a way of understanding that is that imagine um, on this object here, if we, if we um, looked at a small region of that, and I'm looking at a small region because now we're considering very high spatial frequencies, so we've got to look at quite compact regions here. And then imagine putting in a sinusoidal function that rapidly oscillates up and down. Then the more you zoom in and the more you look at higher spatial frequencies, the immediate up and then down of the sinusoidal function um, is effectively multiplied by a constant value within that small region of the image. So you can see any small region of the image here is, is approaching something flat and uniform. If not, you just keep zooming, zooming until you get to a scale where the object is more or less flat or uniform. Then when you multiply it by a sinusoidal function that's positive and negative, which is what you do when you do a Fourier transform, that positive and negative multiplied by a more or less flat function will always give a zero result. So you can see this riemann lebesgue lemma quite intuitively, that basically speaking, as you go to higher and higher values in case space, as you go to higher and higher spatial frequencies, your spectrum will nearly always uh, tend towards zero. So that's, that's quite a, a useful fact to know, uh, especially given what's going on with imaging devices, which we'll be exploring in the next slide, which is to say that this spectrum then is being effectively measured 
by your scanner by multiplication by a transfer function. Okay, that's corresponding to convolving the object with a point spread function. And we know that uh, the transfer function is a Fourier transform of, uh, of the point spread function. And so that also, its spectrum, will also be decaying, kind of almost necessarily. Uh, apart from the fact it's an imaging device and it's never going to be able to measure high spatial frequencies, even just by the riemann lebesgue lemma, the Fourier transform of um, that kernel will always be tending towards zero anyway. So it should be no surprise that when we look at the transfer function, in other words, the Fourier transform of the point spread function, um, here it's the normalized version, the modulation transfer function, defined at the bottom here. It's just basically saying take uh, the magnitude of the transfer function for all the frequencies and just normalize it by the value at, uh, at the zero frequency. This is just one definition of the MTF, the modulation transfer function. It allows us to look very rapidly at what an imaging system is doing. And you see that this is decaying. So therefore, not only are objects already having a kind of a drop off in their spatial frequency content, but furthermore, when you do use a convolution model, um, we also see that the spectrum of the object, if you like F up until now, gets multiplied also by a function that is decaying. Okay, so you can see we're really up against it for trying to accurately measure high spatial frequencies, especially in the context of PET imaging. Um, so that's what I wanted to show on this slide. And obviously just pointing out, this is the point spread function H of R. H of K is the Fourier transform of that, which is what we've been calling the transfer function. And here I'm just representing that transfer function just by this normalized version, the modulation transfer function. So um, this is what's happening in our convolution model. Um, as we know, uh, we've got the true object convolved with a point spread function gives the back projected image. If we look in the Fourier domain, here's that decaying spectrum, that characteristic decay of more or less any object for medical imaging. Um, it gets multiplied by this blue, um, vert, well, basically the transfer function here is just represented by the normalized version, just gets multiplied effectively by the Fourier transform of the PSF, just the convolution theorem. And so therefore the output spectrum um, of the output back projected image is um, similarly decaying and you can see it's just basically that in product with that and so we get this kind of behavior. Now uh, when we reconstruct um, that's not a problem for noise-free data. Um, this is just, again, the simplistic uh, direct inversion formula that we've already looked at a number of times. Um, showing it here, obviously I've got the case where we've got complex numbers, and so I just compensate for that in the denominator just by top and bottom multiplying by H star. Perfectly innocent operation, just multiplies by one. Um, and then we've got um, the regularization case here, where here I've, I've used a constant C, but we've previously seen um, a regularization parameter lambda. Um, and so if we do the, uh, the reconstruction, um, so we get something like this, which you've seen before, but now I'm showing you, that's what's different here, I'm showing you the spectrum of the reconstruction, uh, the Fourier domain description, albeit with this log of absolute value, just to give you an indication of what's going on. First of all, for no regularization, and so we get this uh, case here. And so hopefully, I haven't directly compared it, that is close to the true object spectrum. But then as we begin to regularize, using that Tikhonov regularization, lambda, here I've just called it C, as we increase that value, um, what happens then is that those higher spatial frequencies are less well recovered. So with no regularization, hopefully that blue line corresponds to full recovery of the true object, although it's not quite the case, as we can see. But then as we begin to regularize, this will get smoother. And then that, that smoothness is obviously a direct reflection of the fact that we've been effectively diminishing the amplification of the high frequencies. And that's because this constant offset is applied across all spatial frequencies. And so when this tends to zero, um, in other words, dividing by a small number means high amplification. But when we block it with a constant offset, that means we diminish its ability to do that amplification. So, yeah, and that's why we get more of this sort of um, frequency spectrum that has less content in the high frequencies and therefore less detail, a more blurred image. Okay, so hopefully that's all clear for what's going on in the noise-free case. Again, it's a very simple formula. Don't lose sight of that. But now we're going to take a closer look at what happens in terms of noise. Now, 
to an approximation, and it's quite commonly used as an approximation, noise is often what's known as white noise. The reason we call it white noise is that it's the same level for all frequencies. So, you know, we can crudely talk about all frequencies a bit like uh, the colors of, um, of, of a rainbow, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, um, indicating different frequency, different frequency light has a different color. And so when you add together all of those frequencies, um, you, know, you end up with white light. It's a bit like saying you've got white light, put it in a prism, and then that separates out the frequencies into those different colors. But anyway, that's why we call it white noise. It's basically saying the same level, considering all of the frequencies, all of the colors, if you like. Um, and as we've seen, uh, imaging systems um, all end up, even if they're not just linear shift invariant, just other linear operators, which we will be dealing with um, later on. Um, but they all end up um, reducing, um, attenuating the higher spatial frequencies, as we've seen with that transfer function, which diminishes uh, with, with high spatial frequencies. And that ultimately, there'll always be a cutoff, um, even if it's just by that riemann lebesgue lemma that we looked at earlier, just intuitively understanding what that says about the spectrum of most of the practical functions that we're dealing with. Um, and therefore, um, given the imaging system is doing that um, process of losing the higher spatial frequencies, it's no surprise that reconstruction has to compensate for that attenuation of high spatial frequencies, that, uh, that reduction. It needs to invert that. And so that means amplifying especially the high spatial frequencies. But of course, what, we did, what do we say at the start? Uh, often for data... Um, that we're trying to reconstruct from, the noise is white, and it's the same level for all frequencies. But if we're doing this reconstruction, which has a preferential amplification of high frequencies, it should therefore be no surprise that we end up with high frequency noise a lot of the time in our reconstructions. Um, and so you can imagine the signal um, is also low at those high spatial frequencies. Uh, the signal is also low at high spatial frequencies. Um, because you know, the true object spectrum is going, is going down, and yet, really, we're really up against it, the noise um, doesn't uh, really decay much with spatial frequency. It's more or less flat, and so it's a, it's a pretty tough deal in terms of this reconstruction process, um, the inverse problem we're often, often trying to solve in uh, medical image reconstruction. So let's take a look at that. Um, this we've already looked at. That's just the uh, back projected image. That's its spectrum. Um, and then here's the reconstruction for the noise-free case, the blue line with no regularization and these colored lines showing different levels of regularization. And that's showing, there you go, a reconstruction where that lambda or the C parameter is one of those. I, I don't know which color line it is now, but um, a value of 10. And so what that means is instead of accurately recovering all the high spatial frequencies, we're, we're loosening the process. We're saying, oh, don't worry about recovering those high spatial frequencies. Um, and so sure enough, the reconstruction then is not as crisp as it should be. It's lost the high spatial frequency content and it's a far more blurred looking image. Right, and why do we do that? Well, because of this case here. In real life, we have noise. There's the uh, spectrum of that noisy back projected PET image. Um, and then if we do a reconstruction on that, uh, you can see, look at that blue area there, that's the no regularized case. If we were to visualize that reconstruction, we basically see nothing at all. It would just be a noise dot or two just swamping out all the rest of the signal. Um, but if we do use a regularization offset, that C or the lambda in the previous um, uh, videos, um, then we do actually get something at least to look at, even though, of course, it's evidently a very poor quality image, even so. Um, but then what we can do, this is completely linear, the stuff we're doing here. We will get on to non-linear, iterative, uh, statistical reconstruction methods, but let's enjoy the privilege of linearity for the moment here, where life is actually as simple as it gets for understanding inverse problems. Um, we can now separate out the signal and noise here with the simulated case. And this is just looking at the difference between those two images. This is noise-free and that's with noise. Looking at the difference just leaves us with the noise. Can do the Fourier transform of that. And look at that, it's, as we mentioned before, it's more or less, more or less, 
uh, constant at all frequencies. There is very slight decay there, um, which is white noise. Okay, and so yeah, when we reconstruct, when we do the inverse of the transfer function, you know, it's it's applied to both the signal and to the noise. It doesn't discriminate between the two. It applies its amplification to both of them. And so therefore, uh, when we look at the, the noise spectrum now, look at this, you can see this ramp effect in the, uh, in the noise spectrum. Um, so that's, that's biasing, um, it's giving a higher emphasis to um, higher frequencies. So really off the record here, I guess you could call that, if this is white noise, then you know this is higher frequency, and that's normally, I guess, the blue end of the spectrum. So you could say it's like a, a blue uh, kind of noise, but don't quote me on that, even though I'm being recorded on video. Um, you get the idea. Basically, the, the uh, noise is higher at higher spatial frequencies. And so sure enough, when we look at the inverse uh, Fourier transform, um, there is that high speckled, that high frequency speckled noise. So this reconstruction of the noisy data is effectively what we would have wanted, the noise-free one, plus, unfortunately, that rather horrid amplification of high spatial frequencies. So to summarize on that, before we press on to other concepts, for linear shift invariant systems, so the output, as we know, is just a weighted sum of point response functions, or PSFs. Convolution is so simple, it's just a point object gets replaced by a point spread function. There's nothing more to it. Uh, I can share with you, if you send me an email, videos on uh, convolution because a lot of people get confused about reversal of kernels and you, you're perfectly entitled to calculate convolution that way. Um, but I much prefer a column-based understanding where there's no need to reverse kernels. And certainly for imaging systems, there's no reversal of PSFs going on. Um, anyway, that's an aside just to say it's actually a very straightforward mapping. I mean, in the Fourier domain, um, that makes it even simpler. It just turns it into a multiplication. That's the whole diagonalization we've been talking about. Um, and so that means to, to achieve a convolution, all you have to do is just Fourier transform the object, multiply it by the transfer function, and inverse Fourier transform. That's the same as doing a, a, com a convolution. And, and uh, that allows us to do a really simple reconstruction just by you know, inverting that transfer function. Um, and also, as we've just seen, uh, by looking at the transfer function, that really enables us to understand what is going on, uh, both with imaging devices, in terms of understanding spatial resolution, uh, recovery of detail, and, and, and also, importantly, the problem with noise amplification. Okay, um, so understanding, I hope now you've got a very full understanding of the convolution um, and the Fourier case. Um, because that will give us a great insight into very general, uh, a very general least squares approach, which you can do by singular value decomposition. So SVD, singular value decomposition, is effectively doing that Fourier-style diagonalization now, but, but, but for any uh, matrix, we're no longer going to be restricted to linear shift invariant. We'll be able to, as we'll see later on, deal with linear shift variant systems where the PSF changes um, all over in the field of view. Um, so that's all I wanted to say for this part um, in, the, in, this, in this particular lecture. Just saying what's coming next. So as mentioned, we're going to deal with um, linear shift variant systems next. Um, again, now revisit Tikhonov regularization for that more challenging case. And then that'll lead us into the beauty of the singular value decomposition and how to do a pseudo inverse for a direct least squares estimate. Thanks for listening.